Oh my god, a new Paper Mario is finally on the way in the form of Paper Mario the Origami King, and I cannot wait. Now, at first blush, the Origami King may seem to be less of a return to the classic style of Paper Mario 64 and Thousand Year Door than many have been hoping for, and more of an evolution of the direction set by Sticker Star and Color Splash. But after spending hours and hours and hours looking at this footage, I'm here to tell you that that assessment may not be as accurate as it might seem. Because, for as much as the reveal trailer seems to show off, including story elements, world regions, battle mechanics, vehicles, and more, there is a ton more lurking underneath the surface that the analysis machine was able to uncover. And that includes some surprising routes to Paper Mario's past. So let's stop wasting time and get right to it. And let's begin where the trailer does at Peach's Castle, which is actually remarkable in and of itself. Because, for as often as this iconic location appears in the Mario series, it's only appeared once in the Paper Mario games, way back in the original Paper Mario on Nintendo 64, nearly 20 years ago. See? The callbacks to past games are starting already. The overall design of the lobby largely mirrors that of the original game, with the same checkerboard floor, cloud-covered wallpaper, and a large central staircase leading to a second floor door. All of which is of course based on the castle's first appearance in Super Mario 64, with the only exception being the pink flowers that flank the bottom of the staircase, which are actually a direct callback to the design of the castle in the original Paper Mario. And that's not all, because if we take a quick look at the exterior, we can see that even the castle's flags, which are normally red, are actually blue instead to match that of the original game. Neat! Absolutely spectacular design, spared no expense. Of course, the entire lobby now looks a lot more realistic too, given that's 20 years later. Now sharing the much improved aesthetic of Color Splash, with the environment seemingly being made of real life materials. There are visible cardboard edges everywhere, with a decorative upper layer even peeling off at times as seen with these bricks and floor tiles. And check out the gold detailing on the door, which is actually made out of gold foil. It's all extremely clever and lends the world a cool, almost hyper-realistic feeling. But that isn't to say that there haven't been a few home improvements over the years. Take the windows for instance, which now seem to stretch from the floor to the ceiling. And then there's the addition of a sun mural on the floor, which returns from Super Mario 64. Only this time it serves an ironically dark purpose. But more on that noon, or soon. In fact, this entire room is rather dark and ominous, isn't it? It certainly helps set the stage for what's about to unfold, as Princess Peach enters the room, though looking a bit stiffer these days. And she poses a simple question. Will you crease yourself and be reborn like her into origami form? Yes or no? Oh, and quick aside, we can see that the bomb option can now be easily selected at the tap of the B button. Nice! Anyways, the question seems to be a mere formality based on her response, stating, Wrong answer, right answer, it matters not. Your replies are all paper thin. Goodbye. And with that, the sun mural opens up swallowing Mario whole. Yikes! And it's actually a little ironic given the fact that the sun mural originally teleported Mario to the sky in Mario 64 rather than underground. Expectations subverted. The scenes immediately after then seem to showcase what happens next. When a cutscene of three origami Chai guys, one of which is yellow, enter a room with four of Bowser's normal papery enemies. Which includes a Buzzy Beetle, Spike, Hammer Bro, and a Koopa Troopa. And it's that last one who's unfortunately first in line, as the next scene shows him, in shadow form, being carried away by two of the Shy Guys as the third one stands guard, which we can just barely make out. All the while, a folded up Bowser watches helplessly as he dangles at the end of a rope by a clothespin. And it seems that poor guy is about to witness something horrific, because while we can't say for sure, that large shadow sure does seem to look a bit like a table, doesn't it? But not just any table. I mean the kind you might find in a, you know, sacrificial ceremony? Like, say, if you wanted to convert someone made out of paper into origami? Yeah, it's kind of messed up. Following this, we see something shocking. That yellow shy guy from earlier? Well, he unfolds himself to reveal his true form. Being the origami king, or King Ollie. You can tell he's evil by his menacing purple garb. And according to a press release from Nintendo, his evil plan is to fold up the entire world, including its inhabitants. And that includes Bowser's minions, who he's forcibly enlisting to his cause by turning them into origami, much like Peach as we saw earlier. Now, as part of his plan, he's ensnared Peach's castle within colored streamers, and uses them to relocate the castle to a distant mountain. 
Jeez, King Ollie? More like King Golly, am I right? But thankfully, you won't have to fight King Ollie's cause alone, as his sister Olivia is mercifully kind-hearted, and chooses to partner with Mario on his journey. And yes, partner is the exact word that Nintendo used, which we're pretty sure means she'll be acting as your guide for the entire game, much like Kirsty and Sticker Star or Huey in Color Splash. We can see her accompanying Mario, along with a folded up Bowser, out of the castle into a waiting clown car, piloted by a heroic shy guy. What a great guy! Okay, so that's the overall gist of the story so far, at least officially. But as it turns out, there's quite a bit more to the opening sequence than the trailer lets on. So first up is this screenshot, which takes place before Mario even visits the castle, in which we see he's received a letter from Peach inviting him to partake in Toad Town's Origami Festival. Now, what we're not quite sure about yet is whether this letter was actually written by Peach herself, or if it happened after she got turned into an origami figure, which would change this from being a sincere invite to it all being an elaborate ruse. After all, this entire festival could be King Ollie's doing. How insidious. In any case, what's Luigi doing here? Well, we have two thoughts. Either he drove up and delivered the letter to Mario himself just now, or he actually gave Mario a lift to the festival itself in his go-kart. Which, by the way, is the same one seen in the end game of Color Splash. Pretty cool. In either case, it seems Luigi doesn't stick around, since Mario arrives at the castle as a party of one, before being captured. And that raises the question, how does Mario break out of this dungeon anyway? Well, there are actually a couple of scenes that might provide some insight. In the first one, we can see Mario standing on a diagram of a hand, as the camera then zooms in on Olivia who's pressed up against a wall plate for some reason. We then see her turn around just as the scene cuts away. Thankfully, a screenshot fills us in on what happens next, in which she says, Wow, I'm free from that weird in-between dimension. So it seems that she too is being held against her will here. But in-between dimensions? We're not entirely sure what she means, but it might have something to do with the whole paper to origami transformation. But in any case, she's now free. Though how that came to be, we're not entirely sure. Although, we think it might be related to that wall plate in some way, as it's completely missing from the next scene. And yes, we're confident it's the exact same room, given the hand icon on the floor and the otherwise identical features of the room between both scenes. Minus the wall plate being missing, of course. But where did it go? Did Olivia do something to it? And why was it even there in the first place? We have so many questions. At any rate, now that she's free, she imbues Mario with her power, which allows him to use a technique called the 1000 Fold Arms at these designated hand spots marked on the ground. And we know she's a source of this power because that hand spot wasn't glowing before. To further back this up, another screenshot from elsewhere in the game confirms that it glows even when it's not actively in use. Plus, there's a whole paper folding aspect of his arms, which clearly ties into her whole origami thing. Anyways, another scene shows exactly how this technique works, allowing Mario to use his accordion-like arms to grab and tear away parts of the environment. Another screenshot provides even more details, with a control display at the bottom of the screen revealing that you have to tilt the Joy-Cons to move his arms around, and then pull them back to actually tear away at the environment. But what purpose does this serve exactly? Well, in this specific example, it seems to create a platform that will allow Mario to cross between the walkway and the umbrellas. Now interestingly, we can see a perforated edge around the part that Mario tears, and a second angle confirms that they're visible even before engaging the thousand-fold arms. Which is a little curious considering the fact that, back in the dungeon, there doesn't appear to be any kind of perforated edge at all. So what exactly can you do with that technique here? Maybe the perforations only show up once Olivia explains the technique? It's impossible to say for sure, but we do have one other idea. Because, do you remember that scene where we first see Bowser? Well, if we freeze the clip before the camera zooms in, we can see some kind of frame around the screen. Now at first, it looked a bit like a long hallway. Except, it can't be that, because we can see the edge of the floor in a later scene in that very same room. Which makes it look pretty narrow. Instead, it appears as if we're looking at it from the perspective of a hole in the wall. As if someone's peeking through a gap in the bricks. And if we had to guess who that someone is, well, it's probably Mario. So, maybe he uses the thousand-fold arms to tear away one of the peeling bricks, revealing a hole he can take a peek through, if not travel through. And on that note, another scene shows Mario exploring the very same room that Bowser is being held in, as Bowser hilariously tries to keep up. Look, there's a rope he was attached to! So yeah, it seems like Mario found it in his heart to rescue the poor guy. Oh, and by the way, 
The fact that Mario only has 50 HP, which is the same amount he started with in Color Splash, only further cements this as being part of the escape sequence, rather than the two perhaps revisiting the castle later. And that's a pretty important detail when it comes to unraveling the game's various story beats. Now how exactly Mario, Bowser, and Olivia get from here to the roof isn't entirely clear, but we think there's a good chance that they'll have to pass through the castle lobby to reach it, considering that A, it appears to be the only access point to the second floor, and B, the lobby appears to be a playable space, based on the fact that there are two open doors along the sides of the room. Which, by the way, is evocative of the original Paper Mario, where Peach would attempt to escape this very same castle. I told you, there's a lot of callbacks here! In any case, we're pretty sure that Mario and the gang eventually access the rooftop by way of the door just behind them. We think this because that same door appears in this screenshot, in which the princess and her origami gang threaten the Mario crew with being folded. So we wouldn't be surprised if this is a battle sequence, which would then lead directly to this scene from the trailer, in which the yellow shy guy from earlier who was standing right next to Peach reveals his true form as King Ollie, who then uses his magic to summon the ribbons to wrap up the castle before relocating it entirely. But where exactly does he move the castle to? Well, don't worry, we'll be answering that soon enough. For now, let's focus on those ribbons, as they're far more revealing than you might think. For one, they come in five distinct colors, being yellow, blue, green, red, and purple. And each one appears to reach out from a different section of the world, such as yellow from a desert, and blue from behind these mountains. Now, green isn't quite as clear-cut, but it appears to be winding through a forest to the south. Unfortunately, the locations of the other two aren't explicitly shown in the trailer, but we do see them in screenshots, and in the red one's case, we can see it winding through a more arid mountainous region, which at first seems a little similar to the mountainous region that the blue ribbon winds through, so we're pretty sure there's more to this story, especially since the colors of the ribbons seem to match up with their respective regions. Yellow for the desert sands, blue for the mountain's rivers, green for the forest trees, and as for red, well, what does that color normally represent? Yeah, we're thinking lava too, perhaps from a volcano or something? Which does seem like it would fit in in a more arid region like this. And to support this theory, Paper Mario Color Splash did the exact same thing, using different colors that matched its respective regions. Green for the woods, orange for the desert, which is close enough to yellow, and yep, red for the volcano. In fact, one of the gameplay scenes even shows what appears to be a lava-filled room. And when you look at that, the rocky walls seem to match up with the mountains in the arid region. So that's 4 out of 5 ribbons down. But what about the purple one? Well, if we go off Color Splash again, it was primarily used to represent a group of islands. So we're thinking that might be the case here too, or at least the ocean. Especially since one of the screenshots actually shows that ribbon darting over, what would you know, an ocean. Which is presumably the same one that we see a boat navigating later on in the trailer, in which we can see at least one island, with I'm sure more to follow. But we'll have a lot more of that scene later on. Anyways, we're absolutely positive that these ribbons are tied to your primary objectives in the game, as well as the parts of the world you'll be exploring to accomplish them, being, yeah, five in total. It's actually pretty similar to the past game, such as the six paint stars you had to find in Color Splash, which, by the way, also happen to come in pretty much these same colors, plus one more. And in a neat touch, it seems the ribbons may also act as natural guides to each of those five destinations, as they can be seen throughout normal gameplay. Neat! But what remains to be seen is how exactly the ribbons tie into that goal, or whether they are the goal. I mean, do they lead to a collectible at the end like Color Splash's paint stars? Or do you have to destroy the ribbon at the source? And that might just be how you unbind the castle from its ribbon prison, thereby allowing you to access it and take on the final boss. And speaking of access, there's a super short scene in the trailer that shows off a room with six colored pipes. Now at first, it seemed pretty irrelevant, and yet it might just be the most important scene in the entire trailer, offering a ton of insight while raising even more questions. Okay, so the pipes here are numbered 1 to 6, with the 6th one being found in the middle of the other 5. And those first 5 pipes that make up the perimeter just happen to match each of the 5 ribbon colors. Coincidence? I think not! So we're pretty confident that these warp pipes will act as shortcuts to each of those 5 regions. But what about warp pipe number 6? Well, given its prominent location and dark color, it's almost certainly used to access the final part of the game presumably being Peach's castle, or whatever ends up being by the time King Ollie's done with it. But hold up, because there's a 7th warp pipe here too, and it's super easy to miss, as it's both uncolored and in shadow. Where does that one go? Well, since this room seems to act as a shortcut hub, it has to be accessible from some central location. And we're betting that location is probably Toad Town, which is a hub in and of itself. But more on that soon. 
So if we're right about this room being a hub for shortcuts, then that very concept actually matches up closely with the first two Paper Mario games, which themselves had very similar quick travel hubs in the form of sewers underneath their respective towns. And by the way, those sewer pipes look remarkably similar to the one right here, which could possibly hint at the idea that this isn't necessarily a direct connection to Toad Town, and is perhaps found by way of its very own sewer system. Or maybe not, because we have another theory that we'll get to in a few moments. But for now, I want to focus on something far more interesting. Something that also harkens back to the first two games, as the very existence of this room suggests a world structure closer to that of the first two games rather than the world map approach found in Sticker Star and Color Splash. Because with a world map, traveling around the world is entirely trivial, allowing you to get to any part within seconds. And if that were the case in the Origami King, there would be no need for a quick travel room at all. And yet, here we are. So this could mean that we're finally looking at a return to a single interconnected world, exactly like the first two Paper Mario games, which would be huge! And not just because of what that could mean for world traversal, but it also suggests that the very concept of individual levels with a self-contained goal at the end might be gone entirely. I told you there's more going on here than meets the eye! At any rate, let's get back to the numbers, which we think might correlate to the order they even lock their regions in, or at least the war pipes they're in. After all, War Pipe number 6 is almost certainly the final one as we've already explained. So one might think that would be true for the others as well, right? But if that is the case, then that would mean the Red Pipe would be first? Which we admit would be a little unusual if we're right about that being the Volcanic Region. But going off that idea, that means the Mountain Region would be next, represented by the number 2 Blue Pipe, then Desert with a yellow number 3, followed by the Ocean slash Islands with purple number 4, and finally the Forest with green number 5. But there is a potential issue with this beyond the volcanic region thing we already mentioned. And that's the fact that at several points in the trailer, we can see the exact amount of HP that Mario has. And that should act as a guide for roughly how far into the adventure he is. Assuming of course there aren't any developer related shenanigans going on here. So let's take a quick look at all the HP scenes in what's possibly chronological order. Okay, so first up is the castle's dungeon, which we've already covered, in which Mario has 50 HP. Which again, is the same amount that he started Color Splash with. But then we have this forest scene in which he also has 50 HP. And yet that appears to be pipe number 5. So yeah, we're just getting started and things are already out of whack. We then have this thwomp scene, as well as an underground sequence, both with 50 HP. Next, we have Mario exploring a wheat field, in which he has 70 HP, suggesting it comes a bit later. Next, we have this neon-based Sniffit City, in which Mario has 110 HP, and it obviously appears to be set in the desert. Next, we have what could be a return to the volcanic region in this lava scene with 120 HP. And that's followed by this ocean scene with 130 HP. And finally, we have a battle scene that appears to take place either in the desert or volcanic region with 150 HP. So as you can see, we're all over the map. Or world as the case may be. Now assuming those numbered pipes, as well as our geography, are accurate, then that might mean that these regions aren't your typical Mario worlds. In that, rather than progressing through them linearly, you might be bouncing between them throughout the game. Hence, the need for a shortcut hub. So going off of this idea, we think you might unlock the war pipes in a set order. But that isn't necessarily the same order that you'll first explore each region in. Because once again, it seems like the forest will be up first, despite being pipe number 5. Yeah, it's a little weird, but we'll have more thoughts on that soon. Now here's another question. How exactly does this room work? I mean, are all the pipes available from the get-go, with perhaps something on the other side preventing you from progressing until you reach our region on foot? Or do the pipes only appear in this room once you've warped using the other half? It's impossible to say for sure, but we're thinking it's probably the latter option since that's basically how they worked in the first two games. Now let's return to an issue that we were wondering about before. Where in the world is this room located? Now at first, we thought it might be underground based on the light pouring in from above. But then we notice that if you look toward the ceiling, there almost appear to be windows that line the perimeter. And if we assume that's the case, we notice that there just so happens to be a fairly prominent building in Toad Town that also appears to have windows along its perimeter. But hold up, because there's skylights on the roof too. Six of them to be precise, which matches the number of light sources in this room, being one for each of the six pipes. Furthermore, the columns that line this room sure do look a bit similar to the ones outside the entrance of the main building. So could we be looking at what's inside? It would make a lot of sense for a shortcut hub to be easily accessible from Toad Town. Anyways, moving on, did you notice the giant diagram on the floor? At first, we noticed it looked a bit like a sun, with a triangle seemingly representing the sunlight radiating outwards. And that might tie thematically into the sunlight pouring in from above? 
In addition, if it is a sun, we can't help but wonder if it might have some relation to the sun mural in the castle lobby. But it might also be something else entirely. A compass. And those triangles might actually be arrows pointing in the four cardinal directions, along with a point in between being northwest, northeast, southeast, and southwest. And we think this might be the case because the locations of those warp pipes seems to correlate to where in the world their regions are actually located. Check this out. Let's take the purple, green, and red pipes for instance. Assuming this is a compass, then their respective directions would be to the southwest, south, and southeast. Now if you go back to the scene of the ribbons wrapping up the castle, what do we see? Yeah, the ribbons for each of those colors are approaching from those very same directions, with purple coming in from the southwest, green from the south, and red from the southeast. This is assuming, of course, that the castle is to the north. Pretty wild, huh? So going off of this, the Yellow Pipe's desert region would be to the northwest, and the Blues Mountains to the northeast. So let's map out how that might actually look. So here we have Toe Town in the center, and going counterclockwise, we have the desert to the northwest, the ocean to the southwest, the forest to the south, the possibly volcanic region to the southeast, and then the mountains to the northeast. But that does leave an odd gap to the north. Surely that won't be empty, right? Yeah, we don't think it will be either, because we're pretty confident that's exactly where the mysterious six pipe leads, being Peach's castle. How do we know this? Because the final scene of the trailer appears to show off what appears to be Peach's castle, based on the red carpeted staircase and the black and white floor tiles and it's all set within a mountain setting, and they appear to be the same mountains visible behind the castle as it's being wrapped up, which would put them to the north. And wait a second, do you see that brown mountain right there? Well, if we go back to the castle scene, we can see it rests atop a similarly brown mountain. And that mountain peak is oddly flat, isn't it? Almost as if it's waiting for something to rest atop it. So yeah, we're pretty sure that's exactly where the castle is going to end up at, especially with it being to the north. Spoilers! And hey, while we're on the scene and spoiling everything, let's take a closer look at it. Okay, so first of all, this is almost definitely near the end of the game. The castle is very clearly in a location that's difficult to get to, and it's set against a lightning storm backdrop. Nothing says finale quite like lightning. Now, while this almost assuredly is Peach's castle, that doesn't mean it's exactly as we've seen it before. For one, the castle now appears to be suspended by at least a couple of large chains. But suspended over what? Well, the bright red glow beneath the stairs is an indication, we're guessing a pool of lava, which isn't exactly a surprise given the endgame of most of the Mario series. Now one thing to note though is that that staircase is considerably longer as well as wider compared to the one we've already seen in Peach's castle, which likely means this is an entirely new staircase, forming an entirely new entrance into the castle itself, or whatever the heck it may be now. Furthermore, we can see that Mario is joined by both Olivia and Bowser, now, Olivia is no great surprise given the fact that she's a partner character and appears to be along with Mario every step of the way. But Bowser, as we've already touched on, is another story entirely. Because outside of what we think is the opening stretch, we don't see him anywhere else in the trailer, except for one brief clip, where we can just barely see Bowser along with Mario and Olivia, as well as Bowser Jr., Kamek, and a few other baddies, all hanging out aboard Bowser's airship, just moments before it gets attacked by a trio of stacked paper airplanes. Which, side note, is no mere formation. Those three paper planes are actually physically connected to each other. It looks more like a paper star destroyer or something. Now the impact seems to take a pretty major toll on everyone, knocking Bowser back while some of his baddies get blown off the airship entirely. Unfortunately, the scene cuts away soon after, but we wouldn't be surprised if everyone gets knocked off too. So we're thinking this might be the event that separates Mario and Olivia from everyone else, including Bowser, Bowser Jr., and Kamek, which suggests it probably happens pretty early into the adventure. It actually seems pretty similar to the setup for Super Mario RPG, where a giant impact also sent Mario and Bowser to different corners of the world. But here's a question, when exactly does this scene take place? Well, here's what we're thinking. Do you remember that shy guy that rescued Mario, Bowser, and Olivia from the castle? Well, he emerged from far above the clouds. You know, where Bowser's airship probably is. So it seems logical that that might be where the shy guy returns you to after the rescue. And that could be when the trio of paper airplanes attack. Which, by the way, are essentially a form of origami themselves, and thus are almost certainly the handiwork of King Ollie himself. So having the separation event would explain why Bowser is nowhere to be found in any of the gameplay scenes throughout the rest of the trailer, making it likely that he won't regroup with them until much later on. Although it does appear they'll be meeting up with members of his crew along the way, including Bowser Jr. and Kamek, as we can see them alongside Mario and Olivia in a jungle setting. But more on that soon. For now, there are a few more details in this scene that I wanted to point out. For one, did you catch that at the moment of impact? Not only are the boxes on the ship decks and scattering, but you can even see the lids on the gun ports pop open too. 
It's the little details that really matter. And speaking of impact, these paper airplanes seem to be inflicting some major damage based on the fire and smoke bellowing out. So we wouldn't be surprised if this causes Bowser's airship to crash land. Which we think also means there's a good chance you'll encounter it later on in the adventure when on foot. Woo, alright, so that covers it for most of the story elements and the overall game structure. So let's move on to exploring more of the world itself. And let's start off with what appears to be the center of it all, Toad Town. Although we'll be talking about plenty of other related scenes along the way too. And let's just take a moment to look at the scale of it. Toad Town is absolutely massive by Paper Mario standards, consisting of two levels, 13 different buildings, multiple pathways, a variety of transportation options, and of course, Peach's Castle itself. At least for now. And that's not even a touch on the surrounding areas too. We're pretty confident this is the biggest town in Paper Mario history, with its only possible rival being... Toad Town? Yeah, that's right! Don't forget that Toad Town first appeared way back in the original Paper Mario game on Nintendo 64, where it too was located just south of Peach's Castle. And we're pretty sure that's not a mere coincidence, even if the exact layout is quite a bit different these days. But hey, it has been 20 years. But one major upgrade this go around is that for the first time ever, it appears to be a single undivided region. Meaning, you won't have to travel between separate screens to fully explore the town, which should lend it a more cohesive and open feeling. The main entrance into town appears to be by way of a bridge to the south, complete with a festive looking archway, likely to promote the origami festival. And sure enough, we can see decorations for it everywhere, including banners and all kinds of origami creations, such as what might be a giraffe here, as well as a bird and plenty of others scattered about. And we actually get a close up look at that bird in this screenshot, which means we can place that screenshot as taking place right here. You can even see that museum looking building that we talked about earlier right behind them. Which, remember, might be where the Pipe Shortcut Room is located. And since Luigi is facing toward the hill ahead, that almost certainly means that he drove across the bridge we were just talking about before parking in the plaza. So we're leaning even more toward the idea that he gave Mario a lift into town. Now there's another building just left of the museum, but it's obscured by a text box. But thankfully you get a better look at it from this top-down perspective, in which it appears to be a mushroom-shaped building. And if we zoom in, we can see an icon above the storefront of two crossed hammers. As in, Mario's favorite weapon. So it seems likely that this is an item shop of sorts. Next up, there's a third building on the other side of the museum. And while it's hard to say what exactly it might be for, the signboard out front might suggest it's some kind of cafe. Oh, and there's a warp pipe on the roof too, which is accessible via a staircase on the upper level. Now, moving to the other side of the plaza, we have a yellow home here, which you might remember from this scene in which a giant paper mache Goomba appears to be eating it. Look, he even has confetti all over his face. Yeah, we caught you red-handed, Goomba. And clearly this has caught someone by surprise as they yell, it's eating it. So what the heck is this Goomba's deal? And why is he missing pupils? You can see right through them to his inner frame. It's all a little weird and kind of disturbing. Oh, and check this out. If we flip between this series of pictures, we can actually see that Goomba, or possibly a second one, roaming around in the background. So it seems the Goomba might be a dynamic element going around town, possibly causing more damage? We do see a hole in the floor right here too, with plenty of more coming up throughout the rest of the gameplay. So are paper mache enemies like him the ones that caused all this damage? Now while we're on these screenshots, we also notice something else. And that's the fact that we can see a window opening and closing on the left, as well as a door doing the same for the building just right of it. So do the townsfolk close up shop when the Goomba's around? Although that does remind us that we don't see any actual townsfolk in Toad Town at all. Have they all been captured too, or are they just taking shelter indoors? At any rate, if we freeze the clip before the Goomba turns around, we can see a sticker stuck to its backside that appears to indicate a weak point. So maybe you have to give his back a good whack with your hammer to slow him down or start a battle? Now there is one more odd detail before we move on, because if we go back to this top-down perspective, we can see that that portion of the building is already missing. Which, remember, is from before the castle's wrapped up in ribbon. And this really confuses the timeline, considering I'm not sure exactly when the scene would fit in before the castle wrapping begins. Because remember, that whole event is triggered and Mario and the gang reach a castle's roof and encounters the king. And to complicate matters further, we can actually see a ribbon in the sky behind the Goomba too, suggesting this actually happened after the castle was relocated. <laughs> yeah, this is getting pretty confusing. The only way to reconcile this that we can think of is that the hole wasn't actually created by the Goomba but by something else entirely before the castle was wrapped up while Mario was trapped. As for the Goomba, well he's just taking advantage of an easy meal. For now let's get back to the town, and next up we have these two red roof buildings right over here, which appear to have some decorative elements on top, though we really can't tell what they may be. And just behind them is another home surrounded by hedges, with a giant origami figure in the front yard that we can't quite decipher at all. 
It looks a little similar to the paper airplanes we mentioned earlier, but not quite close enough. To the left is another mostly unremarkable house, but to its right is one just outside the castle with a giant water wheel on the back. We can also see what appear to be a couple of pipes right next to it. Curious. Next, we have a smaller building followed by a much larger one near the castle, with a staircase leading to a door on the second level and then the roof. And that's not all, because we can see that same building in this screenshot with Luigi. And from this angle, we can see there's a second door on the bottom level too. Also, does its right wall here look similar to you at all? It might, because it's the exact same one that Mario tore the piece from earlier. Oh, and while we're here, we should point out that you can see the purple ribbon in the background, further confirming its southwestern direction. And based on its positioning, it appears to be tethered to the castle's new location in the mountains, as we'd expect. And that goes for the red ribbon too, that we can see from a different camera angle at the same spot, which we can see now winds past the castle's original location. Now as for why the camera angle changes, well, we're pretty sure that this is the default camera angle, and that simply moves to behind Mario's back when using the thousandfold arms technique for a better view. Finally, the umbrella that's open here is actually closed when viewed from the overhead perspective, which suggests that they're interactive. Moving eastward, we have a wooden bridge. That seems to be out of service. But when it does work, it seems to provide access to a route that splits off in two directions. The left one leads to a second entrance inside the castle's exterior walls, and we can actually see what that looks like on the other side, as we can see a staircase along the perimeter wall. The other path appears to wind through the hills to the northeast, but we have no idea how far it actually goes. Anyways, just right at the bridge, we have Disney Skyliner. Or, I mean, a gondola station. Which is a cable transport system to quickly get you from one location to another. A bit like a ski lift. In this case, it appears to be heading in a northeastern direction, toward the mountains. In fact, we can even see the cable line in this scene of the Blue Ribbon. And it appears a final destination maybe that Red Mountain right there. We can even see the system in use, with Mario and Olivia catching a ride in a gondola through the mountains. Along with a babom, Or should we say a babom named babom? And by the way, you just gotta love his cute little cross legs. Did Babom's even have legs? Anyways, it seems Babom would join you for at least part of your journey, as a gameplay clip shows him also riding alongside Mario and Olivia in a gondola. Wait a second, we went from one kind of gondola to another? Huh. And we know that this scene takes place at the Red Mountain that the gondola led to, because for one, the red terrain matches perfectly. And for two, we can see the blue ribbon snaking along the river overhead, which again we saw wind right past this mountain earlier, and the river might be what inspired the ribbon's blue color. And speaking of which, based on the fact that the blue ribbon appeared to wind from behind the mountain, could explain why you're following the river downhill, perhaps in an attempt to get to the base of the mountain on the other side. Now even though the gondola has a driver in the form of Blue Toad, we're pretty sure you'll have full control of the boat yourself, given that the controls at the bottom of the screen state that you can move, as well as jump, such as to grab the coins here. And adding to that is the fact that the gondola has its own health meter with 5 heart points, which suggests you'll have to carefully navigate around some obstacles in the water. Now, before we move on, we have a couple more screenshots that provide a slightly different look at this region. First up is this wheat field scene, which we're confident is actually the same area based on the identical red ground and mountain textures. But those grains are so tall, the enemies might be a bit hard to see. Yeah, I see you there, Origami Shy Guy! And that might also be why we can't see Mario's partners taking along, since they're pretty short. Now in the back, we can see a signpost next to a tiny structure, and it appears to have a pair of blue jeans draped over it? We're not quite sure what that's about. And then there's a second signpost to the right with a bridge just ahead. In the second screenshot, we can see Mario, Olivia, and the bomb taking a much needed rest on a park bench. Maybe it's a reward for climbing the mountain? Now returning to Toad Town, we have a pier just below the gondola system. And if we look farther down, we can just barely see a steamboat too. Yep, the exact same steamboat shown elsewhere in the trailer. As well as this screenshot, in which we can see that the bomb will accompany you too. <laughs> this guy really loves anything to do with vehicles, it seems. But, contrary to what the Captain Toad here being behind the wheel might suggest, it seems that you'll have full control of the ship here too, allowing you to sail the high seas to your heart's content, as confirmed by the display at the bottom of the screen. It also shows you can boost with ZR or dive by pressing down on the control pad, though we're not quite sure what that means. The boat doesn't look to be submersible after all, but perhaps part of it is. In fact, if we take a close look at the back of the ship, we can see a crane, which we're guessing you'll be able to use to pull up treasure from the ocean floor, a little bit like in Wind Waker. And speaking of Wind Waker, it seems you'll have a sea chart here too, which you can open with the L button. Finally, it appears they can easily return to town at any time with the press of the B button. Although, why that's necessary, we're not entirely sure. And although we can see quite a few islands here, we're pretty sure you'll only be able to dock the ones with an actual, well, dock. Such as this island right here. At which point, we assume, you'll be taken to a more detailed version of the island to explore on foot. 
And by the way, did you catch that this island is in the shape of a question mark? How very mysterious. So all of this seems to suggest that this might be an expansive part of the game, perhaps far more than you might think. Consider this. The dock is on the east side of town, and yet we already know that the purple ribbon visible in the screenshot winds up from the southwest, which indicates that there's an entire portion of the ocean that we simply can't see from this viewpoint at all. So how do we get to it from the east side of town? Well, there does appear to be two rivers that flow through town from the west, but there's a couple of issues with them. For one, the upper river appears to have a waterfall by the gondola station, which likely prevents you from gaining access to it. But what about the lower river? Well, unless a bridge leading into town is a drawbridge, we're not quite sure how you're going to get past it. Unless, of course, your ship actually is submersible. But that seems pretty unlikely. So instead, it might just be that the ocean wraps around the forest to the south, allowing you to access it by going all the way around. So yeah, this might just be one massive explorable area, especially when you factor in that we can't see any other land masses in this picture. Now before we move on, there's just a few final details involving the boat that we noticed. For one, the gameplay of the scene in the Japanese trailer is just a little bit different, as we can see the ship way off to the side, almost as if the camera isn't tracking it horizontally at all. And we're not entirely sure what this means. Maybe the camera's just way looser than normal? Or maybe it indicates that the boat gameplay might be far more limited than we think, perhaps limiting your movement side to side only to what's on screen. It's really hard to say. Anyways, while we're on the gameplay scene, we can see what appears to be a massive motor on the back, alongside the crane that we mentioned earlier. But if we go back to the Toad Town clip, we can see that the boat here doesn't have either of those features. So maybe you have to find those parts first before we can access the boat? Or maybe the boat's upgradable with the engine adding the boost feature. At any rate, we're finally nearly done exploring Toad Town. So now might be a good time to circle back to where it all starts, at the entrance. Because there is one more area around here that we haven't yet fully explored, and that's a forest to the south, from where the green ribbon seemingly hails. And what's interesting is that we can actually see a path leading through that forest right up to the bridge into town. And as it turns out, one of the screenshots appears to be from along that very same path, based on the matching yellow pathway lined with cedar trees, as well as the fact that we can actually see the exterior wall of Peach's Castle in the background right there. And that is a super cool detail and should make the entrance into Toad Town feel even grander. But what's even more interesting is that we can see Mario and Olivia chatting it up with a gang of Goombas, who appear to be unusually friendly. So it seems Bowser's minions might be willing to help your crew out while their boss is missing in action. Now this raises the question of when exactly does this take place? Well, at the very least, we're pretty confident it's early in the game, and not just based on this conversation or the fact that we're super close to Toad Town, but also because of this scene in the forest in which, as we mentioned earlier, Mario only has 50 HP, which again is the same amount that he started Color Splash with. And based on the fact that this is an even more heavily wooded area, we're pretty sure it takes place prior to meeting those Goombas. But interestingly, while the trees here appear to be the same type as the ones in the Goomba shot, only the ones here have eyes that blink. It's a little unsettling. Thankfully, we have this beautiful still pond here to help distract us. And it even reflects the surrounding forestry. Neat, even if we're not quite sure how paper reflects. Finally, if we freeze the clip at the very start, we can see a treasure chest on the left side. Another screenshot shows off an area that likely takes place in the same region too, which we base on it sharing the same yellow path surrounded by grass, along with Mario once again only having 50 HP. In this case, a ton of thwomps appear to be blocking the path. Although, given the fact that the first one has apparently just slammed down, and yet the others behind it are still at ground level and haven't yet returned to the air, we're thinking that Mario might have actually just ran underneath them to get to the current area. Risky move, Mario. Now, we can't say for sure what order the previous two scenes take place in, but based on the fact that these three all have Mario at 50 HP, makes us pretty confident that this region will be one of the first ones Mario will explore. Especially since Mario games do have a tendency to start you off in green looking areas. So what we're thinking is that this might just be the area that Mario gets blown to after being knocked off of Bowser's airship. Alright, so that covers it for all the regions that we've been able to directly connect to Toad Town. So as a quick recap, that's the Green Ribbon Forest, the Blue Ribbon Mountains, and the Purple Ocean. But that still leaves two regions that we have no idea how you get to from Toad Town, being the Yellow Ribbon's Desert and the Red Ribbon's presumably volcanic region. So maybe the steamboat's how you reach both of them? At any rate, let's take a closer look at the desert, which again is to the northwest of Toad Town. And like the vast ocean, it seems you'll primarily be exploring it with a vehicle, a dune buggy. But it's in the shape of a Goomba shoe! Okay! Anyways, on top of it giving you a full range of motion, it seems to also have a boost feature too, at least based on the motion lines that appear in front of it. Uniquely, nearly every scene in the desert seems to take place at night, and seemingly during a lunar eclipse no less. 
It's a little unsettling. Though we can't help but wonder if it might not actually be an eclipse. But instead, what if the moon is missing entirely? As if it were torn out of the sky. In that case, Mario will probably have to find it. But hey, we're just speculating. Anyways, the yellow ribbon can be seen floating above the sand to help guide you through. Including past a giant toad-shaped tower. But more on that soon. Along the way, you might find yourself distracted by a variety of things. Like pokey enemies, a treasure chest, these weird glowing spots which surely hide some kind of secret. As well as... Wait a second, what's going on over there? It looks like something's digging. Well, if we zoom in, we can see what appears to be a buzzy beetle. Or should we say, a busy beetle. But wait, there's more! Because if we freeze the clip at the very start, we can just barely see some kind of statue on the right side. And it's actually the exact same type of statue that we can see in the back of a battle scene, which might also take place in the desert. And it appears to be of some kind of bird. We also see a pair of them pop up elsewhere in the trailer, only this time spitting lava. Whoa! Now in this case, it doesn't seem to be spitting fire, at least not yet. So we're not sure if it's just a statue, or if it serves some greater purpose. Now speaking of fire, we can see a torch lighting up the area behind the hill here. Which almost certainly means there's something special to find back there. And then we can see that there appears to be a hole in the mountain back here. Oh, and then there's this little gray thing hanging out in the middle of the desert. What is that? We're not entirely sure, but based on this battle scene that takes place in the desert, we're thinking it might be one of these origami boos. Finally, there's of course that giant toad-shaped tower with its mushroom head and short stubby arms. But we're not quite sure what the significance of only one eye being lit is. Is it winking? In any case, it looks a little daunting given it's multiple stories tall, and that there's a save block we can just barely see right outside, suggesting it's probably a place you want to save at before heading in. And speaking of which, what awaits us inside? Well, it's impossible to say for sure, but we think that might be what this scene is all about. For one, there are hieroglyphics of toads on the walls, which you might expect to find in a toad-shaped tower, which by the way we saw something very similar to in Sticker Star. Next, we can see the shadow of what appears to be a ghostly toad, with what appears to be a hole in its head, which is a little weird. Oh, and we even have a toad companion here too, though he looks awfully nervous about the whole thing, despite the fact he's wearing an explorer's cap. Now that hole in the floor ahead suggests that we'll have to take a different route to find that ghostly toad. Although this might be a good time to raise the question, what's with those holes anyway? Will you be able to fill them in at some point? Maybe in a similar fashion to how you could paint in blank spots and color splash? Anyways, that's enough for the tower, because let's move on to another scene, being this incredible looking Sniffet City, which appears to be set in that same desert region. And we actually get a better look at it in this screenshot, where we can also see the lunar eclipse, or perhaps lack thereof, visible here too. And just look at all those neon lights. This is basically Mario's version of Las Vegas. Desert setting and all. Now, the entrance into town is flanked by four spectacular gold snippet statues. There's two up here, and two more just barely visible below. And they seem to be striking a similar pose to the Toad Tower. Weird. But wait a second, what's with those poles there? Well, they look pretty similar to vehicle barriers you'll find in real life. So we think they're there to prevent you from driving your dune buggy through the town. But that also suggests that this area should be accessible just off the main desert. But where exactly is hard to say. Especially since there's no sign of the yellow ribbon here. Now we did notice that the moon appears to be slightly smaller in this scene. Which might suggest that this city is actually set farther back than the desert itself. But it's also entirely possible that's just a trick of the lens. Now, although one might expect to be able to see these lights from miles away. And yet there's absolutely no sign of it from the desert. Huh. Anyways, just inside the entrance is a sign that might be the town's name. But good luck trying to pronounce it. Opku Optic? It might not even be English for all I know. But the emphasis on the O shape certainly does remind us a bit of a sniff at space. Now the main drag here appears to wind past two buildings as it leads up to a massive palace. The first building has a sign featuring a couple of palm trees, along with a hammer and typical Paper Mario items like a mushroom, fire flower, and ice flower. So maybe it's an item shop? Or perhaps more likely a game of chance given the Vegas-like setting. Plus that hammer sure looks like it's hitting a toad. So maybe it's a game of Whack-A-Toad? It would kind of make sense since toads would be considered the enemies of the Sniffets. But let's hold up just a second. If we go back to the gameplay version of this scene, that sign looks entirely different, featuring two neon Sniffets instead. So what the heck happened? Well, the first version appears to have been constructed out of wooden planks in order to cover up the Sniffet sign. But why? We have no idea. Maybe a change of management? The other question is, what order did it happen in? Was that sign built after Mario arrived, or torn down? At any rate, just past that first building is a save block, along with a snippet running a small stand of some kind. 
Now the second building in the back has three doors on it, and a sign featuring what appears to be a musical snippet. So maybe it's a club of some kind? And then of course there's a palace itself, which looks massive. The sign above the door features a snippet next to a palm tree, as well as what might be an animated sparkle. And this sign too, like the first one, appears to have been built out planks of wood. So what's this one covering up? Now as for what's inside the palace, well we're not quite sure, but it's probably something important. Especially those two snippets standing guard outside or any indication. But here's something interesting, the palace seems to be even Arabian style, which is appropriate given that Sniffets first appeared in the Japanese version of Super Mario Bros. 2, being Doki Doki Panic, which itself was heavily inspired by Arabian Nights. We can even see a similar looking palace on the cover. So based on that, we have to ask, is there even a chance that Wart could be inside? Yeah, probably not given the fact that this town seems to be Sniffet exclusive, and that Nintendo seems to hate Wart these days, but come on, a man can dream, right? Anyways, there's a couple of question blocks nearby, with one being just right at the entrance, and another just outside the palace walls on the left. But what's that in the back there? It looks like a giant magic lamp, and it has a green L on it. Does that L stand for lamp? Or maybe Luigi, given the fact it's green? How very peculiar. And by the way, maybe it's just me, but given the fact that the lamp appears to be on a pedestal, it reminds me a bit of the teacup ride at Disney World. So how fun would that be to actually wear a ride over there? But again, that's just quarantine Andre talking. Moving westward, we can see a path that wraps around an oasis that leads to a sniffet by a stand, along with what might be a cave entrance behind him. Now we're not really sure what he's up to, but we couldn't help but notice what might be a couple of checkered flags to his left. So is it possible that there might be some kind of underground racing circuit going on here? Mario does have a car after all, even if it is shaped like a shoe. Finally, we notice something jumping around in the palm tree way up here, but you got us as to what it could be. Alright, that's quite enough about Snippet City, but there is one more screenshot that we have that could possibly take place in the desert too, and that's this disco ballroom featuring a bunch of faceless toads, which is super disturbing. Now there are three reasons why we think this takes place in the desert. One, the toads are all yellow, which is the same color of the toad partner we saw when exploring the temple, or tower. Two, we can actually see that exact same toad hanging out below the save block in the back. See, there's his little hat. And three, these faceless toads seem to match up with the ghostly shadow we saw in the temple earlier, which again appeared to be missing a face too. So maybe you have to track down these multiple faceless toads to reunite a dance crew or something? Now as for where exactly the scene takes place, well maybe it could be inside that music building we saw Sniffet Town? Although, the fact that they're, you know, toads and not Sniffets might make that a bit unlikely. Although that does remind us of one more thing. And that's the fact that all the snippets here are paper and not origami, meaning they all should be friendly. Finally, we have one more crazy idea. Do you remember when we floated the idea that perhaps the moon was ripped out of the sky rather than being an eclipse? Well, that disco ball here is a similar shape, and it does seem to be emitting light. Could that be the moon? Let's be real, probably not, especially because there's one other possibility. Because another scene in the trailer shows a giant paper mache ball rolling toward the camera. And we can't help but wonder if that might be the moon. Its size certainly does look a little bit more appropriate, doesn't it? And we are pretty sure that this scene takes place in the desert, since the yellow ribbon appears to be right there, which we saw earlier weave through mountains that looked exactly like these. The only catch is that, why is it day during this scene, whereas the other desert scenes are at night? Well, we can only speculate that perhaps due to it being slightly closer to Toad Town, or maybe some story event happened. So that wraps up the desert, so let's move on to the final region, being the red one to the southeast, which again appears to be more of an arid, possibly volcanic region. Now we only have a single screenshot that shows a red ribbon in action, as it winds through and even around a portion of the mountain here. The uphill path takes us past a question block next to what might be a cave entrance, along with several origami Goombas. We can also see a paper Koopa Troopa by the signpost, which should also mean that he's friendly. Now the path actually splits off in a few different directions, with the one on the right leading down the cliffside staircase, taking you past what appears to be a couple of windows and maybe a doorway in the wall, all the way down to an area that continues off screen. But you'll also pass by a warp pipe that seems too far off the ground to reach. And unless it can drop to it from above, we think it might be an exit only. But where exactly does it lead to, or perhaps from? We obviously can't say for sure, but we do have an idea. Because did you spot the unique wavy pattern on the wall here? That's actually the exact same pattern that we can see on this giant wheel that's chasing Mario underground. But even if these areas aren't directly connected, we're pretty confident the underground scene at least takes place somewhere in this region based on that pattern. 
Now there is one final detail to note here, and it's a big one. Or should we say a tall one? Because if you follow the path up the hill to the right, we can see a classic Mario style flagpole waiting near the top. Uh oh! Does that mark the end of a level? As in, could this mean that the level based structure of Sticker Star and Color Splash are actually back? Dear. God. Alright, calm down, calm down everyone. Now while anything is technically possible, we kinda doubt it. Because for one, that would seem to go against all the other evidence we've laid out so far. Second, even Sticker Star and Color Splash didn't end the level with a flagpole since you had to collect specific items at the end, and we kinda doubt they would change that, even if there was a level structure in place here. Thirdly, Paper Mario isn't exactly known for jumping high, and certainly not high enough to reach the top of a flagpole. And as far as we can tell, there doesn't appear to be any way to otherwise reach the top of that one there. So we kinda doubt that Nintendo would make them a central part of the game if there's not even a way for us to reach the top. Fourthly, the Red Ribbon clearly continues through this area, so ending the level at a place where the Red Ribbon clearly carries on would be a little awkward. Finally, that flagpole isn't even necessarily the end of the path, because while we can see that path seems to lead up to it, or at least toward it, there is yet another path that splits off from the sign to the left, and that one seemingly leads toward the part of the ribbon that's wrapping around the mountain. But hold the phone, because it seems to be wrapping around a couple of other things as well. One of which is this metallic pole, which we're not quite sure what that's about, but check out the other. While most of it is obscured, we can at least see the base. And what would you know? It sure looks like the base of a typical Mario flagpole. So are there two flagpoles here, or are they maybe two parts of the same hole? We're not entirely sure what's going on here, but it does seem like the flagpoles might be more of a local gimmick than anything else. But hey, we'll have to wait and see for sure. Alright, so that covers every single scene that we can place in the world with some confidence. But there are still a few others left that we haven't touched upon much yet at all. And first up is this scene featuring Mario and Olivia enjoying a nice bath together with Kamek and Bowser Jr.? Wait a second, I'm pretty sure Mario and Jr. hated bath time together. I guess time really does heal all wounds. Anyways, we can see Bowser Jr. say, Ta-da, how do I look? Which at first seems a little random, but the screenshot adds some much needed context in which we can see Bowser Jr. along with his clown copter are both covered in dirt. Perhaps from a rough landing after, you know, being blown off an airship? So it seems this jungle might be where Bowser Jr. and Kamek ended up after being blown off. And that the pool, or bathtub if you will, finally gave Bowser Jr. a chance to clean up. And based on the fact that we can see the chain in the drain stopper, we wouldn't be surprised if you had manually closed the drain yourself. Especially since there seems to be a continuous water supply running directly off the tree. Oh, and we can see some kind of structure on the right side too. But as it turns out, we might actually be getting ahead of ourselves. Because a couple of other screenshots show off even more of this jungle area. And Bowser Jr. is nowhere to be found, suggesting that Kamek is actually the one you come across first. But wait just a bloody second! What's that thing that Kamek's carrying around with him? Well, it's none other than a rolled up version of Bowser Jr.'s clown car. The eyes match perfectly, and it's even still dirty too, which again indicates this takes place prior to the other scenes. And check this out, if we look real close, we can even see Bowser Jr. in there too, along with his distinctive red hair. So it looks like you might actually meet Kamek and Bowser Jr. at the same time. It just seems the latter one might need a little extra help. But while we're on this scene, we should point out the first appearance of the origami patui plants, spiked balls and all. Also, it appears that the two large tree trunks on either side form a pathway they can easily cross over above. Now there is still one more jungle picture left, in which we can see Mario and Kamek being chased by a giant paper mache chain chomp. Terrifying! And yeah, Bowser Jr. is still with them too, as we can see here. Now there's not a whole lot else going on in this scene, except for one pretty cool detail. Do you see that floating mountain in the background of the giant tree? Yep, that's exactly where the swimming pool from earlier is located. We can even see the water running off underneath. That would explain the continuous water source up there. That might also explain how Mario and the gang got up there in the first place. Now, as for where in the world this jungle is located, we really have no idea. But what we do know is that the clouds and sky in the background are pretty unique, and can only be seen in two other clips, including this one of a paper airplane armada, as well as Bowser's airship, which might further cement the idea of this jungle being the landing place following that attack. But there is one other thing we should note real quick, and that's the fact that the paper airplanes that attack the airship are different from the ones in the Armada. So we're not quite sure they're entirely separate events, and where exactly all those paper airplanes fly off to. Although, now that we think about it, could they be what created the holes everywhere just by slamming into the ground? Anyways, moving on, we have a clip of a giant cheap cheap leaping out of the water. 
Except that doesn't quite tell the full story, because it was actually fished up by Mario, who's holding a fishing pole right behind it. And by the way, I love how the Koopa Troopa behind him is freaking out about this. And we can't help but wonder, that might be the same Koopa Troopa from the Red Ribbon screenshot. At any rate, it's hard to tell for sure where the scene might take place, but the terrain does make it look closer to the forest than anything else, between the greenery and all the reflective water. Also, did you spot the shadows of even more cheap cheeps in the water? Are they all supersized? Next up, we have this fun sequence where Mario and Olivia find themselves trapped by a bunch of throwing stars, just before it's revealed who threw them. A frightening amount of ninjas hanging along the ceiling. Also, if you freeze this clip right here, we can see a picture of a thwomp on the wall. But what's that doing there? Well, as it turns out, we don't think that's a mere wall. Instead, we think it's a gate that slams shut. Hence, the thwomp, because that's kind of the thing that thwomps do. It's pretty clever. Now, as we've often been asking, where in the world does this scene take place? And once again, we're not entirely sure. But we are betting that has something to do with a ninja school shown off in this screenshot. Which, by the way, features the only red toad we've seen so far. Curious. But there is one more screenshot that we're pretty sure takes place in the same area, in which Mario and the gang are desperately trying to flee a horde of origami enemies, including Goombas and Shy Guys, as well as paper mache versions of both, plus a Koopa Troopa. Yikes! And we're pretty sure it's the same area based on the Japanese style architecture, as well as an identical looking sky, which might make this a small mountain town of sorts. I say mountain town because there's a mountain literally behind this building right here. In fact, there's even a short clip of this very town on the Japanese website, and it features a map showing that the building we were just looking at is more of a shrine, and it resides dead ahead. Which unfortunately doesn't help us narrow down where in the world it might be taking place. Although, the fact that the bomb is with us here could possibly hint at it being in the same region as either the Blue Ribbon Mountains or the Purple Ribbon Ocean, as those are the only other areas in the game so far that we've seen the bomb in. But curiously, the bomb seems to be missing from the ninji scene. So does something happen to him? Or maybe that scene takes place at a different time or place? Moving on, we have this completely bizarre sequence, and I don't even know where to start with it. It appears to be some kind of mummy-like thing walking down the stairs, and it seems to be made out of hairbands? And why is it alive at all? We really don't know. But whatever it is, it seems like it might be the creation of King Ollie, given the fact that their emblem appears on the blue decoration along the back wall. See? It's got the crown and everything. Now, as for where the scene takes place, who knows? Our best guess is that, based on the rather extravagant or perhaps gaudy decor, maybe someplace in Sniffit Town? The sparkles that do appear around this monstrosity do remind us of the ones that we saw on one of the neon signs. And the same might be true for this screenshot as well, of Mario performing ballet with a bunch of paper mache shy guys. Wait, what? This game keeps getting weirder and weirder. But we also think that there's a chance that one or both of these scenes take place back in the ninja town, given the large amount of enemies in that location. Speaking of enemies, one of the final scenes of the trailer shows off a giant creature emerging from underneath a pile of dirt, right underneath Mario and Olivia's feet, or at least Mario's. But if you slow it down, you can tell that it appears to be a giant turtle, or rather, a giant Koopa Troopa. And we can't help but wonder if that might be the fate of that poor Koopa Troopa we saw getting carried away at the very start of the trailer. If so, poor guy. Now once again, we have no idea where the scene takes place. All we know is that this is likely to be one heck of a boss battle. Speaking of boss battles, there is one more screenshot that we haven't mentioned yet. A battle against a giant paper mache squid while on ship deck. So there's a few things to cover here. For one, this battle is very similar to one in Mario Sunshine. And like that game, its tentacles seem to be the weak spot. As each of them seem to bear the same sticker we saw back on the paper mache Goomba back in town. Except, now that we can see those stickers even more clearly, those aren't just any stickers, as they carry the same King Ollie insignia that we saw back on the wall behind the giant monstrosity. What can we say? The king knows how to market himself. Now at first, you might think that this battle takes place on the same ship that Mario was cruising around in earlier. Except, it can't be. Because not only is the bow of the ship far wider than the other one, but the railing is also purple instead of blue. So unless that original ship got a major upgrade at some point, it seems you'll be boarding at least one other. Of course, given Babom's clear love of vehicles, it's no surprise that he's here too. Finally, there's actually one more scene in the trailer that we haven't mentioned yet. And it comes at the very end. In it, we can see Mario toss on Samus' helmet and then walk around shooting a pretend gun as classic Metroid sound effects play. But the thing is, based on the sound effects and the dialogue, it seems he isn't just pretending but that he's actually playing a game, perhaps in VR. Pretty neat! Although, wouldn't Labo VR be more appropriate given it's made of, you know, cardboard? 
And did you spot the Donkey Kong head over here as well? I wonder if that comes with its own game too. Now in the background we can see a blue toad, as well as another blue toad rolled up in a recycle bin. <laughs> Won't somebody help him, please? So it seems that finding and rescuing toads will still likely be a thing this time around, as we suggested earlier. Woo, so that pretty much covers everything about the game. Wait a second. What's that? Are you telling me we haven't even touched on the battle system yet? Alright, let's take a quick look at it too, I suppose. Now we actually only get a couple of looks at it in the trailer. But thankfully, the official Japanese website posted a much longer clip, and we'll be using it throughout the segment. Okay, so right off the bat, we can tell that the battles look quite a bit different to anything we've seen before. Because, instead of there just being a single row of enemies to deal with, there could theoretically now be up to 12, positioned all around Mario in a 3D battle grid. Now that grid is actually broken up into four separate rings, and you're able to spin any of them in either direction in order to change the enemy's alignment, before then selecting a row to attack. So this should add a major strategic component to the game, allowing you to line up enemies to damage as many as possible in a row. Especially when you factor in the red icon that appears over some enemies' heads, which we think might indicate which ones are set to attack next. Because as this clip shows, if you manage to line up all the attacking enemies in a row, you'll get an attack boost. Nice! But there are two key limitations of play so I'll force you to use your noggin. The first is a ring moves counter, which limits how much you can spin the rings. So basically, you're able to spin any single ring as much as you want, but once you lock it in, that counts as a move. Secondly, there's also a timer too, so you better think fast. But you are at least able to buy more time by pressing the plus button, which we assume will cost you some coins. Now, once you have the enemies locked into place, you're free to attack. So for this segment, we'll be consulting an image that we translated from the Japanese clip. And we can see that there are two main categories for you to choose from, weapons and items. Choosing weapons reveals two options in this case, being boots and hammer, although there's clearly room for much more. But perhaps the most exciting detail about both of those is that there's no item counter next to them. Yeah, what we're saying is that attacks no longer seem to be inventory based, hence why items is now its own category. And instead, you can now seemingly use these attacks as much as you'd like without fear of running out. And the single handily seems to address the biggest complaint about the battle systems in Sticker Star and Color Splash in that you'll no longer have to worry about finding collectibles in the environment just to attack. So yeah, it now works a lot closer to the first two games in the series, which is super exciting. Now as for the actual attack process itself, well it seems pretty similar to Sticker Star and Color Splash, where Mario will attack the selected row of enemies in order, with the effectiveness determined by how well you can time a button press for each attack for each enemy. Now besides spinning rings and attacking, a pop-up menu shows three other command options that you have. You can ask for a hint with X, which we're pretty sure means you'll be consulting with Olivia based on the icon, or you can flee if things get too intense, or you can choose cheer, which I'm pretty sure means the audience will attempt to cheer for you and power you up in some way. And that's likely to be an important mechanic considering every single battle offers ringside seating. It's actually pretty similar to the setup in the Thousand Year Door, which also had an audience watching every battle. Now in that game, not only would the audience power you up, but they would also occasionally throw items at you too, both good and bad. So we can only hope that they might do something similar here as well. But at the very least, we can see that the audience will occasionally spout dialogue, along with some of them apparently getting bored and lying down. Now there is one more question that a lot of people are probably wondering about. Can you have partners during battle? After all, as we've already seen, you'll clearly have partners throughout much of the game. But can they actually help you out in combat? Unfortunately, the trailer only shows Mario fighting solo. But, as it turns out, the Chinese version of that same trailer has a slightly different version of this scene, and it shows the yellow explorer toad from the temple standing alongside Mario during battle. Now, we don't know to what extent they'll participate, but hey, at least there are partners in some form. Plus, based on how big the platform is that Mario is standing on, it should be able to fit quite a few partners at a time if it came down to it. Heck, there's probably room for that entire Goomba gang from earlier. And that pretty much covers it for the battle system, besides maybe the fact that the arena obviously changes to match the region you're in. Woo, we're just about done here, but there are still a few final details I wanted to point out. First up, throughout the trailer there are two HUD icons that might have noticed that we haven't touched on yet. One is a 1-up that appears next to your HP, which we're assuming brings it back to life if you run out of health. But the other is a bit more interesting, being a big icon that appears in most of the gameplay scenes. And it seems to change size and color depending on how full it is. So what the heck is this? Well, this gondola scene might actually offer a clue, because along the bottom of the screen, we can see the option to throw confetti. And we'd be surprised if that's unique to this boat sequence. So we're thinking that that bag may indeed be full of confetti, which would make it a somewhat limited resource. But what is it for? 
Maybe it's used to distract or disorient enemies? Well, in any case, it seems Mario may have used it in this screenshot with the Goombas, because there seems to be confetti all over the ground. Next, if you go to this Bowser's Castle scene again, watch the shadows on the ground carefully. It looks like the way forward is being blocked by a bunch of falling bricks. A little bit like Tetris. Huh, wonder how you get past that. Moving on, if we take a look at the box art, we can actually see a few more enemies and allies not shown off anywhere else. On the enemy side, we have the Origami Swoop the Bat, Sniff It, Charging Freaking Chuck, and a Bone Goomba. Whereas on the ally side, we get confirmations of Red Toad, who we're guessing represents all the Toads, a couple of Goombas, Shy Guy, Koopa Troopa, and Spike. Finally, we have one more clip to show you from the Japanese website, in which Mario encounters Spike in some room before he spits up your bomb buddy! How rude! But what's far more interesting are the six portraits of Princess Peach along the back wall. Because they're not just any portraits, but they represent her appearances throughout all six of the Paper Mario games. In chronological order, we have Paper Mario 64 in the top left, Thousand Year Door in the top right, Super Paper Mario in the middle, Sticker Star to the bottom left, and Color Splash to the bottom right. And of course a big one represents the Origami King. So it really does seem like this game's going out of its way to pay tribute to its past. Oh, and there you have it! We're finally done covering the Origami King, thank god. Alright, I'm gonna go to bed. Please like and subscribe. Catch you later. Bye.